So I think Catherine, we might move on to our next speaker, which is Tom Honeyman. And the topic is handling software publishing requests. Tom is a software project program manager at Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC. Tom leads a program of work seeking change in practices across Australian research, namely recognition of research software as a first class output of research. Okay, and are we ready, Tom? Uh, as long as my uh, slides are showing up. Looking good, Kira Tom, off you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thanks for that introduction and thanks also for the opportunity to speak today. Um, before I leap into software publishing though, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today, uh, or many of us anyway, uh, and uh, pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And today I'm joining from Gadigal land. So Richard Hamming was a mathematician and occasional futurist whose surname pops up often enough if you're a programmer or, or amongst other things. Uh, in 1997, in the art of doing science and engineering, he opined, I would think by the year 2020, it would be fairly universal practice for the expert in the field of application to do the actual program preparation rather than have experts in computers do it. And 25 years on, he's actually pretty much spot on. Uh, experts in computers are still an important part of research, but the expression of data analysis in a form that could be called software or code uh, is actually really common in research. How common uh, is research software in research? In 2014, the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK surveyed a thousand randomly selected researchers across a range of research areas. The results showed that research software is important to about 90% of researchers and about 70% could not do their research without it. Turning specifically to the creation of software in research, the summary findings of the 2018 OECD International Survey of Scientific Authors estimates that about 33% of scientific production results in new code. So why am I here today talking about software? Uh, if you've heard of the ARDC at all, uh, it may well be in the context of our work over many years to raise the profile of data, including with one of our predecessor organisations, ANS. Well, while the ARDC's purpose is centred on data, our mission includes analysis of data, and research software is an enabler of data's value. So to that end, uh, last year we released a draft national agenda for research software calling on Australia to see, shape and sustain research software to work towards recognition of research software as a first class output of research. The draft agenda was uh, validated with the community and a final version incorporating community feedback is due soon. This year, you should expect to see a range of research software related activities and materials emerging from the ARDC. So especially in the context of big or rich data, uh, software is an essential part of working with data. In the context of reproducible and transparent research, it is important to make data available to verify findings, but it is also important to provide the code used to analyze that data to understand and reproduce analysis and analytical decision making. Research software is part of the scaffolding that holds up research findings. It is the lens through which data comes into focus. So, to improve the visibility of research software, today I am talking about publishing this software using best practices. So before we go any further, I need to explain what I mean when I say software. The word software possibly conjures up for you the kind of software at the bottom of this diagram. Uh, this is the longer lived uh, kind of software usually produced by developers or software engineers inside and outside of research, especially. Uh, who are pretty much on top of software publishing. I'm not talking about these kinds of tools or applications today. Today, I really want to narrow our focus and talk about publishing the top two layers of this diagram. These are most commonly produced by researchers who are unlikely to have awareness or expertise in software publishing best practice. And at any rate, best practice also looks a bit different to publishing longer lived software. At the top of the diagram, 
the scripts, code, notebooks, computational workflows, and other forms of code that are created during a research project in aid of a research outcome, I will simply call analysis code. Or this is conventionally known simply as code in many research domains. Uh, these are often single use and most critically, they are discarded or overwritten after they serve their purpose. They're almost never shared. Uh, this is not just analysis, but also the often invisible steps that precede it in generating and otherwise handling data. Researchers produce a lot of this code every day. This is the kind of software I'm mostly talking about how to handle requests on today. But below that are what I'll simply call prototype tools. This is less common than the first, and right now you probably won't encounter it all that often. In contrast with analysis code, these are tools intended to be used by others. Novel, cutting edge methods and models in research captured as software often emerge within funded projects, and much of it is only maintained while it is funded. Because this kind of software can disappear or cease to work relatively quickly, it is important to preserve a record of work done. So why will these researchers increasingly come to ask for help with publishing software? Well, my first guess is they won't. Uh, if they do, they'll come for other reasons relating to scholarly publication. They may be asking about data publication. If you have the opportunity, you may like to check in about whether they're considering or even able to make their analysis code available in parallel, or maybe even required. Uh, the framing here, especially if they wanna publish their data, is research transparency and integrity. For prototype tools, they may be looking to publish a related article publicizing to their research community the existence of the soft tool, software tool they've created. In this case, it might be worth asking a few more questions about how they made their software available. Tracking impact may be the best framing for such a discussion, switching from citing an ordinary URL uh, to a proper identifier can help with this. Also possible is that they come seeking an identifier such as a DOI for something data site DOIs are not actually appropriate for. The method of publishing I'm about to talk about will provide that DOI, but possibly not in the way they'd like. Finally, they may come because they're fired up about change in research practices driven by scholarly society, funder, publisher, or institutional policy. Some scholarly societies and publishers are now actively talking about code availability, uh, and this is starting to flow through into affiliated journals. So for instance, uh, nature portfolio journals do ask that code be made available, but not necessarily published. If they're not satisfied with a request for code by an editor or a reviewer, they can refuse to publish the paper. So nature gives advice on software publishing, which is actually compatible with what we at the ARDC advise on software publishing as well. And on a different tack, if the researcher is aware of the FAIR principles, the final release of a set of FAIR principles tailored for research software is nearly here. And this is the result of a joint working group led by members from the Research Data Alliance, Research Software Alliance and Force 11 from around the world. Uh, at the ARDC, we're in the middle of adopting these principles in various ways. So keep an eye on our newsletter to find out about future activities on this. So we currently provide software publishing guidance from the perspective of enabling software citation. So I recommend reading up on software citation best practice via the link here. Also linked here is a single sheet printable resource CC BY uh, you can hand directly to researchers or you can save the trees and email it to them. Uh, I'm gonna step through the content for that right now. We have three preconditions to publishing in the guide. First, uh, the uh, researcher should use a code development platform such as GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, or possibly their institutional version of those. Uh, then they should get an ORCID because they're great. Uh, and then they need to choose a license. So we've got relevant resources for navigating all of these things. Then basically the core for the publishing workflow is a single step process but one that will possibly seem odd to many used to making their code available via a personal or project website or via a code development platform. And that is uh, that they need to make a snapshot. Snapshot is a moment in time version of the software. 
software inversion control systems captures edits in a really highly sophisticated manner. But for many purposes in research, what is needed first and foremost is a moment in time snapshot of the code. So if it's analysis code, then it is the exact iteration that was used to analyze the data, particularly if that's accompanying a paper. If it is a prototype tool, then there may be only one snapshotted release, uh, but for both of these types of code, there can be more than one type, uh, more than one snapshot. And in this case, there are DOIs for each release or each snapshot, uh, and there's a head DOI pointing to the latest snapshot uh, at any given time. Should that be of interest to the to the researcher? The most developed infrastructure to date are the research generic repositories Zenodo and Figshare. And if your institution uses Figshare as its institutional data repository, then it's suitable for the workflow described in the guide. There are integrations that make snapshotting fairly straightforward with both of these services. You can even reserve an institutionally controlled data site DOI and specify that as the DOI uh, with Zenodo, or either of these services will provide a DOI for you. An institutional data repository is potentially an option, and so are domain repositories, which will have their own guidance. Perhaps your institution is not currently set up to capture the software I described today. If you're thinking about making the change with your own repository infrastructure, feel free to get in contact and uh, discuss this further. And here are a second set of options that can exist at the same time as the first set. So another option is the UNESCO supported software heritage. Uh, this is an archive for open source software. There is a simple submission process for code developed openly on a code development platform. Note first that this snapshots the entire repository. So this is inclusive of all of the revision history. Also, they do not use DOIs, but rather a high granularity intrinsic or calculated identifier system that allows people who cite to make precise reference to specific versions, revisions, components, or even spans of code. Uh, if the researcher is producing software submitted to a package manager, it may already be archived here. A second choice is uh, software registries. So this is really the community's response to an absence of clarity and in infrastructure. Uh, and the genesis of these systems was driven by a community need to precisely identify software and literature in the absence of a system to do so. Software registries are commonly are common, especially in fields where software production is common. Often expectation from peers is that researchers submit their software to these registries. The 600 plus research software registries in existence perform a range of overlapping functions compared to the infrastructure I described on the previous slide. Uh, some cross-reference scholarly articles related to the software. Many provide in-house identifiers rather than utilize uh, common infrastructure like DOIs. Some cross-reference across different ide identifier systems. Uh, and many capture domain-specific terminology, either formally or informally. Many or most do not house the software registered in them. Uh, and many of them allow submissions from users of software rather than the authors of the software or in addition to the authors of the software. And this can potentially lead to creating duplicates or um, there's also the possibility of low quality metadata being submitted. Uh, the link I provide in the slide is from the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK. And it's a really good list uh, of many of these registries if you're interested in exploring those. Uh, both software heritage and software registries can be used in a complementary fashion with regular archiving, and they do serve sort of complementary uh, purposes. But the critical change we're seeking, in addition to making code available though, is that software is kept in a snapshotting system. Uh, code development systems uh, or code development platforms like GitHub uh, and personal or project websites don't actually uh, perform this function. So apart from the mechanics of snapshotting, where else will the researcher need your help? Uh, certainly navigating relevant metadata, which is clearly documented for Zenodo and Figshare. Uh, this is an area of expertise which uh, researchers will need your guidance in. Uh, understanding software citation practice, uh, best practice is also critical. Um, publishing software in this way enables best practice citation. 
So I want to wrap up by drawing your attention to three resources, uh, our guide on software citation and making software citable, and a general resource at the bottom, which is full of links um, for further reading in a large number of areas. Um, and not shown here is a new interest group we'll be launching soon called the Visible Research Software Interest Group. Uh, for methods uh, and mechanisms of making research software visible, this will be a place to connect with others trying to do the same. So sign up to our newsletter to know uh, about it the second it is launched or shoot us an email. If you grab the slides later, these are my contact details. Uh, and um, it, here also is a QR code for those people who are interested in signing up to our newsletter and haven't done it yet. Um, and uh, queries of any kind uh, can go to the IDC, including about that visible research software uh, interest group. Uh, they can go to our contact team who can connect you with the expertise you require. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Tom. That was really interesting. I didn't realize that uh, research data was um, creating so much software in itself. I deal normally with, um, I suppose, the humanities and creative industries. So. But even those guys have lots of um, data that they generate and don't know what to do with it. Yeah, well, uh, actually, <laughs> um, uh, humanities is, uh, so that same survey that I mentioned at the top, uh, the International Survey of Scientific Authors, um, uh, it's basically present across all research areas. Um, mm. So uh, humanities and social sciences are uh, definitely producers of code, um, mm. uh, believe it or not. Uh, I think at the bottom yeah. of the list is actually chemistry, um, if you're yeah. if you're curious. Uh, and oddly enough, at the top of the list is computer science. But actually, there's a lot of it going on um, across yeah. the whole of research. Yeah. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, and the first one is: Do researchers wanting to publish software know that libraries are there to help them with metadata? I often think we are invisible to researchers in this space. Take yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, a, it may not be an association that people make, um, but that's why I was talking about it from those other perspectives as well. And I think over time, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think the library uh, has got this, uh, basically. I think these are all familiar topics applied to a new object basically. Um, this is citation practice. This is metadata for describing research outputs. Um, mm. And um, I, I think the experts in that are in the library. Yeah. Okay, so there's another question here. As a software developer who worked in the software industry long before coming to research infrastructure, I'm curious to understand more about what you're saying about snapshotting. Why is it insufficient for researchers to cite specific versions of software, e.g. some data tidying library version 1.3? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, this really um, pertains to uh, record keeping requirements, uh, basically, and uh, being oh. able to connect from a, uh, a cited resource to the actual resource if it's open, uh, basically. And the problem with using websites or simply using a name or an identifier, uh, sorry, a name and a version number is that that doesn't necessarily guarantee over time access to that software. Uh, and the, right. what we're trying to fulfill there is that people can connect to the specific version used in the research uh, at any time in the next, say, 20, 30 years. Uh, software mm -hmm. is notorious for having a very short um, lifetime. Yeah. Otherwise. Now, it doesn't guarantee that they'll be able to re-execute it, um, but it does, particularly in source code, it's really good to make sure that they can access it. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that's, oh, we do have another question. Right. Will ARDC produce any OA resources that libraries can use to educate themselves and researchers on research software? I think you do that. Also, can we invite ARDC to talk to our researchers? Uh, yes, to both of those, uh, basically. Mm -hmm. Just get in contact and let's have a conversation. Yeah, that would be great. Well, we probably wouldn't do that in New Zealand, but, you know, <laughs> if you want to... We <laughs> love our friends across the uh, 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 the puddle. Uh, yeah. So, yep, yeah, uh, shoot us yeah. an email. 
Yeah. Okay, well, that's all the questions we've got for you, Tom. Thanks for your presentation. It was really enlightening. Thanks, everyone.